the business model of business is broken. Most notably, the idea, the very thing that helped businesses grow, which was size and scale and economies of scale, being a multinational global corporation and taking advantage of all those efficiencies is now the very thing that is strangling, you know, the albatross around its neck. A relationship with the right referral partner could be a game changer for any B2B company. So what if you could reverse engineer these relationships at a moment's notice? Start a podcast, invite potential referral partners to be guests on your show, and grow your referral network faster than ever. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands. And I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to the B2B Growth Show. My name is Ethan Butte, co-host of the Customer Experience Series here on the show. If you believe that retention is the new acquisition, then you're in the right place. Our guest this week wrote Flip the Funnel a decade ago, and that was its primary thesis. He's versed in brand, in customer experience, in marketing, and much, much more. He's been a thought leader for decades, and his fifth book, Built to Suck, was recently released. Enjoy this conversation with my guest, Joseph Jaffe. Hey, thanks so much for clicking play on this episode of the Customer Experience Podcast. I am so excited to be joined by someone who's had a significant influence on my career and the way that I look at my work and look at the business world and life in general. I'm going to do a medium-sized setup here, so you're going to have to wait just a second to hear from Joseph Jaffe. See, I just spoiled it. But Clue Train Manifesto, Flip the Funnel, Six Pixels of Separation, Trust Agents, Content Rules. These are books that had significant impact as I was trying to transition and imagining what my life would look like as social media, new media came up. And Joseph Jaffe was one of the big voices in that for me. Longtime thought leader in new media, social media, customer experience, marketing innovation, currently the admiral and co-founder of the HMS Beagle, which is a uh, strategic consultancy and, of course, a a really smart nod to Charles Darwin and the survival of the fittest. I think survival is going to be a big theme here today in the episode. I also really feel like, Joseph, that I got to know you through your conversations with Mitch Joel on Six Pixels of Separation, great long-running podcast on your Across the Pond is that, was that what it was called? Across the Sound. Across Close. the Sound. Sound is even a, a better one. And then author of five books, including Life After the 32nd Spot, which for me, I was living around the 32nd Spot working in local television. And you drew a future for me that I could identify with immediately. Flip the Funnel, which of course is, I, I hope to get into that later in the conversation. And the brand new Built to Suck That long introduction, Joseph Jaffe, thank you and welcome to the Customer Experience Podcast. Leah, thank you so much for having me. And of course, you know, I got this book yesterday. I I laid my hands on it on my beautiful fifth baby yesterday. So it is so new and so current. And there's there's an amazing I use the phrase baby, by the way, because they say that writing a book is like birthing a child, which of course I wouldn't know firsthand but I actually spoke to a female author and she said it's actually more painful than birthing a child. So that's why I think it's the right uh, analogy. Another thing, just two other things uh, based on what you said. One is in rattling off, you know, six pixels and content rules. I'm obviously thinking of, you know, I'm thinking of of people that I have the privilege of knowing, working with, you know, uh, CeCe Chapman and obviously Mitch Joel and Chris Brogan. I also remember that uh, where I was when I read Clue Train Manifesto myself, I read it quite late 
And it, a lot of it was kind of, it was outdated, you know, talking about like, you know, lists and listservs. Sure. You, know, you, you looked at it not as a, this is not current anymore, this is not relevant, but from a historical standpoint. And that's always been my goal in writing books, that you don't read something that you go, this is, this is so 1995, or this is so, more importantly, this is so 2018 or 2017. You want something that can become a timeless classic. That's always been my goal. And then the final thing to tell you is because you just said all these things that made me think. So we called it Across the Sound. We called it Across the Sound because Steve Rebell was in Long Island and I was in Westport and we were separated by the Long Island Sound and obviously the play on sound, ha-ha, audio podcasting. And it's weird because, you know, it only lasted... 13 episodes, I think. And Steve went back to micro persuasion. And then eventually I rebranded it as Jaffe Juice. But, uh, you know, it's still in the lips and uh, a string across the sound. So I still have a, a, a tremendous affection towards it. So good. And so for all the people who have not read Clue Train Manifesto and some of the other stuff we just ran through, this is just a groundwork for, for web for, you know, direct to consumer, for consumers having voices. And we'll get into all of that. And I think it's kind of the groundwork for where you are today with Built to Suck. But um, let's start where we always start here on this podcast with customer experience. Please give me your, your thoughts, definition, characteristics. When I say customer experience, what does that conjure for you? So I, I love the question. And I actually think I defined it in Flip the Funnel. And I think I called it the some, you know, because I try to use the same syntax as, as how branding is defined. And this whole idea, and I think I called it, you know, the sum total, uh, the collection of every single touch point that connects with, that touches, that interacts with, that affects or influences the customer directly or indirectly. And I wanted to be quite clear about that, you know, directly or indirectly. It's also influenced by this idea, uh, you know, Regis McKenna wrote a piece called Marketing is Everything. And I've always believed that everything, again, that touches or affects the customer should be considered to be marketing's responsibility. But of course, marketing has become almost like a, you know, a bastard stepchild, a laughing stock. There are so few seats on the board at the board level by the CMO as well. And so we've seen how marketing has lost its credibility and its influence. But of course, customer experience as almost a... And, uh, it is a higher order than customer service, right? Service fits into experience. And as I'm sure we'll talk about today, experience fits into obsession. Oh, lo- love it. Uh, that's a really nice preview. But let's go back to uh, to Built to Suck, the subtitle, Inevitable Demise of the Corporation. Very provocative, as is Built to Suck in general. Provokes a lot of curiosity. Just in general, what are the primary factors at play? What do you think about when you think about the demise of the corporation? You know, what are the main ideas under that? So, the, well, there's so much to unpack from even, you know, just that statement. So first of all, let's start off with the fact I was asked, why not call it built to fail? And, and my response, it's a little, I suppose, flippant and snarky, but, it's, but I feel failure is too good for corporations because, you know, entrepreneurs get it. They understand the power of the pivot. They understand how failure should be embraced. They understand how done is better than perfect. And I felt that, you know, just say built to fail for corporations. I was like, you don't even deserve to fail because, because you're worse than that. And, and then, the, you know, the other part of it is the inevitable demise of the corporation, dot, 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 and how to save it with a question mark. You know, so the, look, again, I'm a geek. I'm a, you know, I love, I look at my writing as, as art in a sense. And, you know, when, when Apple sees the whole idea of think different and, you know, and, and, and that whole idea. So I wanted to like, of course, ending it with a question mark. Why a question mark? It's grammatically incorrect the way I wrote it. And the whole point is, I don't know that the corporation can be saved. And even if it can, corporations are their own worst enemy and ultimately will not be able to get out of their way. I use a whole bunch of analogies, but the one that strikes me is the fact that, that I have this chart in the book. It shows, it's a timeline of, of history, of civilizations over 5,000 years, the rise and the fall of the Roman, the Ottoman, the Byzantine Empire, there's Nazi Germany, even at the bottom right, and it's a little controversial, is America. You know, and every single one of those 
empires and civilizations have risen and fallen. Not one of them has been able to outmaneuver or outlast, you know, the survive analogy, outthink, outlast, out, you know, outsmart time. And so how arrogant are we to believe that this corporate empire that has only really been around in earnest for a hundred years, give or take, will somehow be able to cheat time. And we've already seen, you know, so I have about six or seven different data points. I wanted to bring in this book, not only the anecdotal, right? The Paylesses, the Sears's, the Toys R Us's of the world, but the empirical. And I have a ton of data. I was quite clear about the fact that I, I, I didn't want to be alarmist. And I, you know, a lot of people are citing information that is actually not correct. So we hear this one that 70% of Fortune 500 companies from 1990 are gone. 50% of Fortune 500 companies from 2000 are gone. That's correct. But gone does not mean dead, right, or bankrupt. It means not in the Fortune 500 anymore. And what that really means ultimately, and why this is so significant, is the loss of market cap, is the fact that, that you know, even if they're not in the Fortune 500 anymore, boy, oh boy, does that mean that they've lost a tremendous amount of momentum and growth and market capitalization. But there's a whole ton of them. And again, I won't go into a litany of it because we could be all day, but just the fact that the, the lifespan of the corporation has dropped from 75 to 15 years in just 50 years. You know, and I actually went out and, 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 uh, and I was like, wait a second, I want validation for that. And I found multiple sources. One of them most recently is from uh, General Stanley, uh, Stanley McChrystal's new book called uh, The Team of Teams. It's even coming up from, from a general. Mm -hmm. so, so the information that we have at our disposal says the cracks are evident and the demise is apparent. I'll give you one more and then, and then I'll hand it back to you, which is over the last three years, 51% of Fortune 500 companies have had declining revenues. So the right, you know, Yogi Berra once said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. So I say, if the writing's on the wall, read it. And if you read it, it's basically saying kind of you're on a one-way track out of town unless you embrace your heresy, unless you adopt, and I've come up with my four growth pillar approach. And even so, it still may be too little too late. So that's my honest message. The point is, this isn't a fairy tale, so there isn't necessarily a happy ending. So anecdotal and evidentiary or quantified elements there and a sighting of a general by an admiral. Okay. Yeah, true. Titled admiral. I didn't think about that. That's good. So Obviously, I think a lot of people are probably nodding their head going, yeah, I can see that. Oh, I get it. Oh, gosh, I didn't know that. So go one step deeper there. Why is this the case? What are the weaknesses or even, you know, to your inevitability there, the fatal flaws of the corporation? I have a feeling that a lot of them connect specifically to customer experience because customers ultimately, no, maybe not. I'm, that was a leading question. I'm wondering if, uh, if customers dictate the survival or if there's something else inherently wrong there. Can you just go to some of the weaknesses and fatal flaws yeah. and, and the relationship to customers and whether or not customers can save this? So, so you've, done a, you've done a great, a, a really smart thing by already connecting the growth pillar ultimately to the demise. And the reality is if you kind of turn them on their head, every one of these four pillars, the kind of um, the reverse of them, or the, I think corollary is maybe the writer, the writer, the more correct way to think about it is, you know, when you think of digital disruption, right, custom obsession, corporate citizenship and talent resurrection, it should be true that all four of them are failing, that, that corporations are failing in all four of them right now, which is why by figuring out how to adopt them or, or deliver against them, they might return to growth. But actually, the four that I cite in the book, I call them the four horsemen of the corporate apocalypse. And the first one, the first one is size, right? Why did I call the book Built to Suck? Because uh, Jay Scheidt, many people have said it, but Jay Scheidt, who I used to work for, uh, for the agency that Scheidt founded, he said, let's see how big we can get before we suck. Recognizing that suckage was inevitable with size. My hypothesis in the book is that twofold. One, the business model of business is broken. Most notably, the idea, the very thing that helped businesses grow 
which was size and scale and economies of scale, being a multinational global corporation and taking advantage of all those efficiencies is now the very thing that is strangling uh, you know, the albatross around its neck. So number one is size. Number two is age. And you know, I actually say in the book, I'm not an ageist except when it comes to inanimate objects like a corporation. So the fact is, 100 years, companies that crow and brag about 100 years of history, they should be looking at that as a liability, not an asset, because they, will, they almost surely will not be around in 100 years' time. And what I say in Built to Suck is that if there is a cut off. For me, it's millennial companies and younger. So born after 1980. But the key is that even those companies will suck. It is inevitable. You know, Facebook already sucks. And then I have some, right at the end of the book, some uh, thoughts from Jeff Bezos about Amazon and how ultimately Amazon is, you know, I mean, I'll just say it right now. Bezos said to all his employees, you know, after they had announced the winners of HQ2, of course, now we've since learned that they're pulling out of Long Island City, he said, one day, two, we will suck. One day, two, he didn't say those words. He said, one day, we will fail. One day, we will go bankrupt. And your job is to delay that for as long as possible. Brilliant. My point is, if he can say that about Amazon, there isn't a single company on this planet that is immune. Now, the third is being a public company. And I talk specifically about why Elon Musk had a basically a nervous breakdown or just smoked weed, which we're not doing, you know, on the Joe Rogan experience. Um, right. Because, you know, visionaries don't like to be told what to do by external shareholders. And that really gets into the, the scourge of, uh, you know, the, the, what I call it, a, C, a CTD, a co- corporate transmitted disease, right? It's not an STD, it's a CTD, you know, the short termitis, this disease of short termitis. Of, and then the fourth one is culture. And, and right now, of course, that's a huge problem in these companies in terms of, you know, creating a culture that tolerates and embraces failure, that, that embraces the gig economy, that knows how to attract and retain employees as well. And of course, inherent in everything you said, knows how to serve customers better and what customers really want in terms of value, in terms of values, right? Value and values, which gets into corporate citizenship. So that's tying it all together in a big red bow. So uh, go on customer obsession. So you, you've referred to the four pillars, digital disruption, talent resurrection, customer obsession, and corporate citizenship. And you, you already A, listed them, but then also kind of unpack them a little bit. Let's go just because customers in the name of it, go into customer obsession a little bit. What, a, what is that one all about? And why is it one of, you know, if there are four primary thrusts that are going to keep this corporation propped up for as long as possible. And I love that you cite uh, Jeff Bezos on the inevitability of it. Talk about customer obsession in particular. What does that, what does that mean? What does that look like? How, does it, how do you know what are the signs of a, of a corporation or a company, whether it be young or one of these you know, 50, 60, 80-year-old companies, what is a sign that, that, a, that a company is truly obsessed with customers? Well, you know, it's interesting because I, I came up with that phrase independently. And it was only after the fact, as I was even editing the book, that I actually saw in Jeff Bezos's um, day one memo, which I encourage and I do in the book, everyone to read, he actually uses the phrase custom obsession. And it just made me feel so good that I've actually found several companies that have used that phrase. I didn't, I actually love that because I didn't want to be like, you know, let's coin all these new terms and hope they stick. I love the fact that there is equity in that because it is ultimately the truth, right? You want to speak the truth. You don't want to re- reinvent the wheel here. Sometimes you just want to be able to draw attention and shed light on these universal truths as well. So obsession for me is almost unhealthy. Maybe it is unhealthy because it is a fixation. It is a at all costs. It's, it's borderline being a customer stalker, you know, like without breaking the law. And, you know, there is a passion in there, but there's also a, you know, a prime directive to use a little bit of a geeky Star Trek, you know, analogy as well. And, you know, when I write that chapter and I say, you still don't get it and I can prove it. You know, I wrote an entire book on it called Flip the Funnel on customer, I called it then customer experience. The Z and the R of zero, zealots and and retention were dedicated to it. I extended the thinking. In this book, I almost felt like, you know, 
I can only dedicate one chapter, but I almost wanted to say, just go back and read these books for God's sake. Just read them because these books, you know, speak the truth. I guarantee you that you will walk away from, from going back and, and, and brushing up on your flip the funnel on zero with actionable, practical, pragmatic, you know, and, and valuable insights. But it comes down to this truth, right? Which is if 80% of our revenue comes from returning, recurring, business, our customers, our retention bucket, why are we spending 20% of our or less of our total marketing dollars against that revenue contribution? And then of course, you take it one step further and you say, wait a second, in B2C and even more so in B2B, 80% of that revenue that retention revenue is coming from 20% of those customers. And, and, you know, now we talk about the whole ABM model focus now on, on, you know, somehow we woke up and said, wait a second, we should treat our best customers better. You know, revelation, you know, <laughs> the, the tablets have been revealed. It's insane to think that only now we're kind of recognizing, you know, the fact that ultimately we have been neglecting our customers. And, and of course, you know, for me, talent resurrection is the internal customer. We have an external customer and we have an internal customer. And I'll just go back to, to this whole notion, which is it still, it, it infuriates me, you know, when you see companies offering promo roll-offs and discounts for first-time buyers. You know, as I often say, your first-time buyer is a stranger and your competitive conquest or switcher is a prostitute. They are a promiscuous customer, which makes you a pimp. So just own it. You know, you're courting strangers and prostitutes. And is that how you want to build a business that is built to last? No, that's how you build a business that's built to suck. So, you know, in this chapter, I still talk about a whole bunch of things, priceless experiences, customer of the month, customer funerals. But I also kind of talk about AI. And I think AI, if you want, like the role of Twitter should have been for customer service as opposed to, you know, our, our first direct to consumer president. I still believe that that's Twitter's amazing role. Now we have to be able to say there is a, you know, and there are specific roles that we need to think about in terms of how we engage and how we, and technologies and AI for me is all about surprise and delight and treating our customers better. So as I say, there is no A or I in customer, but perhaps there should be. Talk a little, just another minute or two on AI. Just close that loop a little bit for people that are like, oh, AI, okay. How? Yeah. So, so I have a, a very, um, a little model or a little three-step process that I created, which corresponds to crawl, walk, run. And I call it automation, augmentation, and auguration. And, and the, you know, the whole idea of the, uh, to augurate is, is the alchemy. It's to transform. It's very kind of, you know, cauldron bubbling and, and, and mystical because that's when, you know, that's when all these incredible connections, that's when Watson starts to rear his ugly head, etc., or at least claim he is, because he really just is a glorified weather forecaster, I think. But my point is that, you know, most of what we're calling AI right now is just automation. Let's be clear about that. Dumb machines doing dumb people's work for the most part, replacing them because, like, you know, uh, because ultimately it costs less to do so and less mistakes are made. I'm being a little cynical, but I'm, I don't mean to be because at the end of the day, you know, certainly it is wrong and I'm not calling someone who once operated a toll booth dumb, but I'm saying these were menial mechanical tasks. And certainly in some cases, automation has been great, especially in industries where, you know, there are fatalities and there's, you know, heavy industrial machinery, but that's all we're doing. We're, we're calling it AI, but we're just looking really to fire people and save on overhead and save us money. You know, augmentation on the other hand is when computers, when machines and humans work side by side. And that's where I think customer experience can really, and customer obsession can flourish. You know, these are a simple example sometimes of, um, you know, as I say in zero, don't pay for attention, pay attention. You know, I recently was at a Four Seasons. I checked into a Four Seasons and I was with my daughter and we were looking at colleges. And when I called to make the reservation, they said, is there any special occasion? And I said, yes, I happen to be visiting a college close to where you're located. And they took a few, you know, and they asked me a few questions. 
When I arrived, they looked at me and they said, this must be your daughter. You must be so excited to be visiting colleges. Now, I've had other experiences with the Four Seasons where I ended up in my room with a big fruit basket and and there was a handwritten note that said, you know, this is your 10th time at this Four Seasons. We wanted to, I wanted to personally thank you. It wasn't a printed handwritten note, right? It wasn't the Dakota font. It was handwritten. So that's what happens when humans and machines work together as willing bedfellows. And I'm still not even quite sure that that's AI in a sense. But there's certainly this this belief and I think recognition that in a world of big data, you know, as I wrote in Zero, big data, big dummy, right? Big data has forced, has made us dumber, not smarter. But when we can actually figure out how to create connections and make connections and create these causal relationships and inferences, that's when magic happens. And ultimately, if you go back to Marketing 101, you know, we're in the business of surprising and delighting, right? We're in the business of under-promising and over-delivering. And that's where I think AI can play this incredible role. That was awesome. You know, you just really went deep into one of my personal primary motivations for going this direction with with the, the customer experience podcast in general, which is, you know, personalized is not personal, that there's a difference between those two. And what you just did there is you let the machine personalize and you let the human, or you walked out an example where the human makes it truly personal, where someone looks you and looks your daughter in the eye, greets you warmly and sincerely, human to human, eye to eye, face to face, and creates a truly personal moment. And right. so- and, and I just want to, and I just want to add like another thing that I said, which is, you know, let's put the custom in customer. You know, one of the big case studies in that chapter is Netflix. You know, th- there is a great quote from one of the Netflix executives, which says, we have 33 million versions of Netflix. And Amazon has done similar with their personalization of their homepage. So that's where technology can help which is, you know, I totally agree with what you said. And I just, you know, those two buzzwords, right? Personalization and customization are thrown around. But do we really understand what they mean? And are we really delivering against them? And not in the way those two companies you mentioned are. Hey, uh, we've already uh, driven by a little bit, flipped the funnel, which again, for me at that point in my career, I read it maybe two or three years after it was published. And it's coming up on its 10th birthday, by the way. I don't know if you're going to throw a party for it because to, it, to me, it's foundational. I should. Yeah, totally. Well, will you but, come to it? Yeah, I, I will absolutely try. If you give me an invitation, I will show up at a flip the funnel birthday party. Retention is acquisition. Customer service as a company's real differentiator for the future. And really this kind of the rise of influencers, but not in the way we talk about it now, which gets a little bit back into the prostitute and pimp uh, a metaphor you're talking about, but real influencers, true advocates, and, yeah. and the way that social media gives them a voice. These are just some of the key themes, and it was very good looking. Yeah, and, and I actually coined this term, which I don't even think I wrote. It's funny, the marketing bow tie, which has become so, you know, really, I've, it's, it's blown me away in terms of how it's been received and adopted by Fortune 500 companies. I just threw it in right at the end. And, and it was actually Jeremiah Oyang who looked at it and he's like, this is really good, Joe. And I was like, oh, should I put it in? Like, Because it was, it was the day before I had to hand the manuscript in. So thanks, Jeremiah. And, and I really developed that whole thinking in zero. So a lot of the thinking kind of continued into, you know, and, and through zero. But one of them also is this idea of the super consumer, right? Who is the super consumer? The super, I mean, I'm telling you, if companies just do this, they're going to win, right? Which is when you look at the people that buy you a lot, and those who talk about you a lot to a lot of people. When you combine influence with actual business, right, with with actual patronage, that is the most, forget about loyalty, that is the most influential and credible customer referral. So like, you know, this is the thing that we still missed even with with my second book, Join the Conversation. With whom? Who do we want to just have these conversations with? With our customers, with our loyalists, with our zealots, with our advocates. And so the super consumer is the influential customer because all you got to do, they've got the megaphone. Just get out the way and let them talk and let them celebrate. And, And that's also another thing that I brought into, into Built to Suck, this idea of priceless experiences. You know, the ability to give our customers things that money can't buy. That's why it's priceless. So I, I have a little photo in my book 
exploiting my child. My son, you know, ended up walking onto the field with uh, at a New York City football club game at an NYCFC game. Those things, you can't pay for them. There's no price tag to buy to be a mascot, you get it through loyalty and through loyalty points. And so, you know, that's, that's what happens when you connect all the dots and you're giving people these things that are just, wow, they will never forget those moments as long as they live, but they might forgive you for, uh, you know, uh, you, you messed up. The product was, the, you know, I spoke a lot about recently about what happened with Zion when his Nike shoe broke, you know, playing for Duke in, in a college basketball game, you know, Nike might get away with it once, but excuse the pun, if they slip up again, they're dead. So the thing is, we will forgive, you know, just like our spouse, just like our, our, you know, our clients or, or the relationship we have with them. We will, if we've earned that credibility, if we've earned that integrity, if we've earned that trust, we'll always have a second chance but we may not always have a third chance. And I think that kind of brings it together as well, which is, which is the super consumer. We need to foster those and find those people. And when you plug them into the actual R&D engine and create that voice of the customer innovation loop, I'm telling you, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's like, it's weird that it sounds weird, but, but like anybody just listening to this interview, like a corporate executive, I'm telling you, just listen to this podcast and do everything we're talking about. And I promise you, you will be successful. You will return to growth. This stuff is not necessarily rocket science. It's kind of common sense. And now is the time to act because, you know, as I said, these large corporations that house you, you know, and give you this false sense of security, they are failing and they are going to fail increasingly so and fast. Rant over. Great. Um, I want to, you know, before we uh, kind of button this up a little bit, and it's been amazing. And as we talked before we hit record, I'm sure we could go a lot longer. Well, I know we could because you're, you already spoke to the continuity, like your body of work right. over the past 15 years or so it is all one continuous uh, evolved story. I'm just going to tie back to the beginning, tie back to built to suck, the inevitability of it, this, that there's some life cycle that just like a human being in a human body, if you treat your body poorly and you execute poorly, you don't exercise, you eat like garbage, you're going to pass sooner than someone who takes care. So you can, you can extend, but there's an inevitability and we all, our day always arrives to die. And so it's interesting with, you know, with the HMS Beagle, the Darwin reference, which is a biological reference. It's a survival of the fittest. There's mm. kind of this biological undertone to this conversation. Do you think, and, and the same thing with civilizations, right? So civilizations are uh, human constructed in a way, but they also are organic and have a little bit of a life of their own. Have you thought on that theme, like this theme that ties the human lifespan with a civilization lifespan, with a corporate lifespan? What is the biological underpinning here have you do you have any thoughts on that yeah i mean totally you're you're totally on the mark i'm bob leides who's the ceo of the uh, association of national advertisers they're the body that you know kind of you know um houses all of these senior marketers at these corporations so i'm just reading his endorsement he said i'll just you know he said this time he's brilliantly demonstrated how companies ages are just like people Corporations must stay young, fit, and agile or face the outcome of an early death. So he's even taking this idea of premature death, right? This is, you know, this is clogged arteries and incredibly high levels of cholesterol and so on and so forth. Darwin said, it is not the strongest of species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one that is the most adaptable to change. So part of this anecdote is, is change you know and this and part of it is transformation and reinvention like you know i had a little bit of fun in the book which is at the time apple and both amazon had become the first trillion dollar market cap company so i said well we need a term right we call you know billion dollar market cap companies unicorns so i think i came up with phoenix and 
the other one I was thinking of was Hydra, which was more just kind of like death to everybody else. Yeah. But the Phoenix, the interesting thing about the Phoenix is, is, and I did a little bit of research, is there's really only one at any given time. And it's funny because Apple's dropped off since. But I think, yes, I mean, absolutely. So, you know, with age and with size, what's really happening from a cultural standpoint is legacy and incumbency and resistance to change and bad habits and silos. In fact, that was, that, that was the, the premise. The premise was that large companies today have become you know, too big, too political, too dysfunctional, too siloed, you know, too risk averse. They're slowing down when the world is speeding up. And that's the essence, right? They are moving in a different direction to momentum, to change. And that's why, I mean, it's a very simple way of just saying, like, ultimately, this is the road to the future, and they're on the road out of town in the exact opposite direction. All right. Quick personal opinion here for you, because this also is a biological theme that I swear is not more than two steps away from where we, where we are right now. Biohacking in Silicon Valley, uh, blood transfusions with young people's blood, you know, the, the types of things that folks are doing to try to extend human life. I, think, I believe there's a gentleman who's, who's announced formally that he's on a quest to live to 200 or something. Any personal thoughts or opinions on these, some of these what seem like over the top efforts to extend human life? Oh my God, that is, uh, and, and, and I use that phrase, God, um, you know, a humans playing God. That is not a question that, that I expect it to be asked. I mean, listen, there are two ways to look at it. And I think it is kind of, um, you either take a religious or an, or complete agnostic or, or even an atheist point of view, right? One is, is look how great we are and look, look at all the tools that we have and uh, by golly, we're going to use them all to, to, you know, just continue to soar closer and closer to the sun, right? Like Icarus, which leads to the second part, which is at what point are we in fact playing God and, and crossing the line? I mean, my point of view and, and, you know, I mean, look at what happened with Theranos and there's been so much stuff in this space. I think the inevitability and the reality, you know, bringing it back as objectively as possible is it cannot be a bad thing that in maybe not in our lifetimes, but our children's, that there will be a cure for cancer, right? We've seen it with HIV. So the ability for us to cure disease is fantastic and we should do more of that. The ability to live to 200, that's going to come at a price. And uh, it just has to when you look at population and overpopulation. Going back to corporate citizenship, I actually talk about in the book how you know I encountered... Um, I'm very familiar with an organization that called, called Global Citizen, and they put on this big concert, and, and Hugh, who started it, his whole mission is to make poverty history by 2030. Well, what's going to happen if we're living to two? I mean, it's just, it's going to be insane, right? All these mad megalomaniacal, you know, overpopulation. Remember the movie, The Kingsman, and yeah. all these maniacal, you know, kind of villains trying to cure. It, it, it just, it takes us down, down a path that we may not get, you know, get back from. Thank you so much for that diversion. I appreciate it. I'm glad I could surprise you, I think. So I'm excited to hear your answers to, to a couple standard closes that we do here uh, because we're all about relationships. You were so quick and so kind to respond to my inquiry. I saw that uh, that Built to Suck had been released. I saw your Facebook post reached out and we did not set this up any more than, say, 16 hours ago. So again, we're all about relationships. So I like to end these, these conversations with your opportunity to thank or mention a person who's had a positive impact on your life or on your career, as well as a company that you feel is doing, and you've already named several, so think of maybe one more, uh, who's doing customer experience the right way, who's really delivering for you. Well, I, you know, it's funny. I mean, I think I'm just going to point to people that are actually um, on the back of my book. Philip Kotler, Professor Philip Kotler, who, uh, you know, I learned marketing and I was inspired. I, I didn't even know that I was going to specialize. But when I read his book, when I was at college, I was like, this is who I am. This is who I want to be. Rashad Tabakawala, who's always been like a role model and a mentor, one of the smartest guys I know, you know, just, just incredibly succinct and cynical, but in a beautiful way and super, super intelligent. You know, those are two people that are even on the back of my book. And then you've got, you know, other people like Chris Burgrave, who 
used to be the, the CMO of AB InBev, Moran Budweiser or their Super Bowl advertising. Before that, he was a Coke. I've had the privilege of becoming really good friends with my ex-clients who are now you know, consultants or whatever and building relationships with marketers. And uh, it was funny because at the back, his endorsement, he, he said, Jaffe may appear to be the high sparrow of paranoia, which, you know, if you watch Game of Thrones, you know who the high sparrow was and the reference. And then I said to him, wait, Chris, hold on a second. You know that the high sparrow basically got nuked by the wildfire you know, and him and all of his disciples got kind of bombed. And he said, well, that's the price of being a heretic. And that's what you are. But then he does come back and calls me Andy Grove 2.0, which is a much bigger compliment. So I think, you know, the ability to cultivate these relationships within the marketing community, with thought leaders, with executives, and move together to move the industry forward. It's a collective body of people and conversations that have made their mark on me. Awesome. Is, and is there another company that, that you feel like, you know, you cited the football club there in New York. I forget the hotel. Was it a Ritz Carlton? It was a, well, Ritz Carlton's great too, but like the Four Seasons. Four seasons. Yeah. Th- I mean, there are many, there are many examples, but you know what? I almost, you know, one thing I said was, I'm going to give you a lot of this, the expected companies, right? The Nikes, the Apples, the, the Netflix, the Amazons, but I want to explain to you why we cite them all and the reasons why they've, they've done so well. The other one is Starbucks. I've just really, really, it's not just a great brand, but everything from going back to the talent part, right? Part-time barristers, giving them full healthcare and, and stock options and benefits and paternity and maternity. This is the way to think about running and building a business, the Starbucks experience. And, and it is the one company that I actually write at the end of the book. I, I go through the four pillars and I show how they're delivering against each one. So, you know, I'm paying homage to the companies that we admire, but I'm explaining to you why we admire them and what they're doing right and what they're doing really, really well. And of course, at the same time, calling out some of the companies that aren't. Uh, Joseph Jaffe, this has been awesome. I sincerely appreciate your time. I value your insights. I love what you've contributed to, I just call it the conversation at large and the way that you continue it. Congratulations on your fifth book. If someone wants to connect with you online or wants to check out Built to Suck, what are some ways that people should connect with you? Thank you for asking. The book's website is builttosuck.com. That's when I knew it had to be called that because that I couldn't believe it was even available. So Built to Suck will actually give you a lot of stuff besides obviously please pre-order the book from Amazon do it early and often. And you can link to, to that from the site. But there's a lot of good stuff on that, that website. There's the ability to download a piece of IP that I created called the Survival Planning Canvas and the Startup Survival Planning Canvas. It's free. I didn't want to like, you know, have people register. I want people to live this and, and, and build their survival plans. There's a lot of bonus content there. And I'm starting a little blog as well where I'll talk about companies that suck and companies that I'm placing on what I call Death Watch as well. So Built to Suck is one place, an obvious place. The HMS Beagle, like uh, alluding to Darwin, we help our clients navigate the journey to survival because we believe everyone is in the survival business nowadays. And that URL is the hmsbeagle.com. And then of course, you know, I'm pretty much Jaffe Juice on every social media platform. I have to admit, I'm the most um, active these days on Instagram. I just happen to kind of live this more visual world. I'm probably the least active on Twitter and, and, and Facebook, they just have really lost their shine as far as I'm concerned. But you know, when somebody calls me out, good or bad, I typically know about it and I will respond to you. Excellent. I wouldn't expect anything different from you. I so appreciate your time. Thanks for going long on this episode. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And uh, I bid you a great rest of your day and a wonderful weekend ahead. Thank you. And it was absolutely my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed Joseph Jaffe's energy and ideas as much as I did. If you want to hear more conversations like this about how sales, marketing, customer success, and other teams within the organization are working together to create and deliver better customer experiences, check out the Customer Experience Podcast. It's available in iTunes, and you can go directly to it by visiting bombbomb.com slash iTunes or bombbomb.com slash Spotify. 
where you can see video clips and overviews of each episode at bombbomb.com slash podcast. That's the word bomb, B-O-M-B, twice, bombbomb.com slash podcast. I'm Ethan Butte. Thanks for listening. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast, and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.